right. Good morning, everyone. Today we're here to discuss the alternate economic status form. Joining me today, I have Jane McLucas from our new child nutrition team, Paula Gravel from our finance team, and Jessica Karen from our title. Um, is it title ESEA team, right, Jess? Yes. <laughs> All right. So we will go ahead and get started with our topic. Um, before we get into um, alternate economic status, I just wanted to give everyone a heads up about the upcoming webinars for the data team. Um, we do have a quarterly reporting webinar next Tuesday at 10 a.m. That will be for attendance, truancy, bullying, and behavior reporting, which is due in October. And then we will have the following week on the 19th, a dropout reporting webinar for uh, federal dropout reporting requirements. And we will also have an EPS October 1 student enrollment webinar on the 26th at 10 a.m. Um, once we get into October, we'll have our staff certification report webinar on the 3rd. And then following that, we have office hours every Tuesday at 10 a.m. for anyone who is um, who would like to come and ask questions. We'll have updates about upcoming reports, things like that. We do have some topics that we'll discuss, um, but we will be, um, that will be a more, it'll be a different format than these types of webinars, more of an open forum. For today, our guides for this work for the alternate economic status form can be found on the EPS guides page of the Help Desk website. It's our middle tile. On the EPS guides page, you will find um, economically disadvantaged status information and the alternate economic stat disadvantaged status form um, that we have one from last year and then the new updated one this year has fewer, um, it doesn't include any information about lunch. And so it may be less confusing if you want to use that form um, for this reporting year. So the FY24 has been entered uh, onto the website for everyone to use. So this is kind of a background of why we're uh, why we have this alternate economic status form. Um, historically, we've been able to use the free and reduced lunch meal forms in applications for purposes of EPS funding, child nutrition, and for ESCA. Um, however, with an implementation of special provision two and community eligibility provision, um, this model for child nutrition does not allow for the collection of free and reduced lunch forms. And so the alternate economic status form has been implemented for collecting student level poverty data for the purpose of of EPS specific funding. Um, so this is a tool specifically for the purposes of EF ESEA um, funding. And I know we have- Hold on, you, you, said, you, you just said something wrong and I just wanna really quickly, you said ESEA, you meant EPS. Sorry, EPS, yes, sorry. I, don't, I, I just don't wanna get anybody EPS confused. Today. It's okay, I, I understand. So please forgive yeah, my interruption. I'm that's okay. I am. I'm just seeing now. I'm seeing more comments about the slides changing and not being able to hear. Yeah, people um, aren't hearing us apparently. Yeah. Um. So I'm not sure. We usually, if we can hear each other, we can. Um. People are able to hear. So if we could have some other input for people who are maybe hearing us. If you could let us know, there is a delay. Um. But with the slides changing, um, maybe there's a problem. So if you can hear us. If you could just let us know and we will have this recorded so that we can um and the work we should have the volume included in that as well for the recording because it will come from my computer so we'll just wait for some feedback okay so we do have some volume i'm wondering if maybe uh, maybe it's an issue with um, speakers on the user end. Um, so thank you for that feedback. Okay, so we'll continue through. Um, so once again, the alternate economic status form is for use uh, for EPS funding purposes only. Thank you, Paula, for adding that detail. <laughs> So economic status is what we use for school funding for EPS. Um, schools participating in community eligibility, eligibility provision or CEP um, and or special provision two 
um, in your non-base year, so you're not collecting your forms in uh, subsequent years after your non-base year. Um, for school lunch, if you're not collecting those forms, then the EPS alternate economic status form will be your option for reporting for EPS funding. Um, so that is just an alternative. If you're not able to collect your uh, free and reduced lunch forms, then you are able to collect for EPS uh, funding purposes the alternate economic status form. Alternate economic or economic status is collected in uh, three different ways. So we have direct certification from DHHS. Uh, we have application of free and reduced lunch forms, and then we have the alternate economic status form. Um, once again, that alternate economic status form is only for EPS purposes, whereas the free and reduced lunch um, meals form is used for a few other purposes as well. Before you so, move on, Allie. Hope you don't mind me interrupting again. Sure. Uh, before you move on from that one, somebody's asking if the nutrition department does not share the direct cert list, how are we able to get that information? Which is so the di direct certification is automatically overridden in Neo, so you shouldn't need access to. You can look at aggregate counts of the um, students who are on the direct certification list, but you um, those students will be overridden in the Neo. Um, modules. So in other words, they're automatically identified as economically disadvantaged for EPS purposes is what she's saying. So you don't have to check the direct cert list to see who is direct cert for this purpose. It automatically gets put into our system. Correct. So this is just a visual of how historically um, the Application for free and reduced lunch meals has been used. Um, the, historically, these bubbles overlapped completely. And so the free and reduced lunch meal applications were able to be used for nutrition, ESEA, and EPS purposes. However, and they're still able to be used for that purpose. However, with this implementa implementation of special provision two and CEP, um, we um, some districts may not be able to collect that uh, free and reduced lunch form which now we have the alternate form for the purposes of EPS. This form is not to be used by anyone um, who has nutrition, who works in the nutrition department in the district. It should only be reported by data specialists. Um, so the, EP, uh, the alternate economic status is for data specialists in EPS funding only. There's a bit of a hierarchy in determining uh, economically disadvantaged status qualification for EPS funding. So you have your alternate economic status form, which is more a global blanket. All students can have that collected, even if you're using CEP or special provision too. Um, it can also be used for um, maybe families that don't want to send back their free and reduced lunch form for the purpose of um, receiving a free meal. Um, this form can also be used for those families. Um, if, uh, they, for the if you do not get this form back, um, Paula may be able to speak a little bit more to the implementation and impl implications of that. Um, but if you don't get these forms back, um, it can have an impact on your funding. Um, and so having a way to inform families of the use of economic status for state reporting for funding can be really helpful in getting these forms back from families. So you have that alternate economic status, which is more of a blanket um, that everyone can use. Um, and then you have free and reduced lunch meals, which maybe we get a little bit more narrow with um, school districts that may not be able to receive free and reduced lunch forms. Um, and then direct certification is gonna be a smaller um, bunch of students because um, those are gonna be your students who are specifically identified by DHHS and are automatically marked in NEO for that uh, economic status. Ellie, can I interrupt again? Yeah, I saw you were unmuted. I was gonna give you a second. <laughs> People are still uh, asking some things. Some people still aren't hearing. What I've done is I've said I'm really sorry about that, um, but it, this is being recorded and they can they can download it later. Or for that matter, we are we are always accessible if you have specific questions. 
the other thing about the uh, direct cert list somebody wrote so i would then have to enter the data in our sis now personally i'm not sure exactly what that means uh, i don't know the linkage to what they need it at the local level. I only know what we need it at the EPS level, so I'm not going to be able to respond to that. However, somebody on this call is going to be able to help with what that is. Um, but I also just wanted to make sure you understand, again, the focus of the alternate form is so that we receive the information that we need for funding related issues only for state funding with EPS. There are other requirements that you need to collect information for that this alternate form cannot be used for. Anything federally funded, it cannot be used for. This is because we know over the years, because of the changes in, um, first of all, nutrition, as well as titles and, and whatnot, that many districts are just no longer able or families aren't willing to send in the free and reduced lunch form. So we've created this alternate form in the meantime to try to get what we need for EPS because of how the statute is right now. The requirement for economically disadvantaged in the law says eligible for, for federal free and reduced lunch. We're looking into an alternate for that. Another way of determining economic status for purposes of EPS funding. We haven't determined that yet. So in the meantime, we created this to try to get as many uh, forms filled out from your district as we can so that our percentage of economically disadvantaged used in the formula for your district is as close to what it truly is as possible. I hope that helps. As far as the, again, getting Drexer into SIS, I don't know what that is, why you would need that. Maybe Allie knows better. Well, in terms of that, so your local SIS does not necessarily have to match what you're seeing all the way up through into NEO um, because, and so for example, um, if you have a student who is marked in your local student information system as um, such as PowerSchool Infinite Campus or something, um, you are going to have that student marked with the best knowledge that you have. Um, and so then that is subsequently what gets uploaded into Synergy and then gets moved into NEO. It's then overridden in the NEO system. There's nothing that's going to kick back an error on you that you have to fix in Synergy. Um, it's not going, uh, you won't have, uh, it's not going to create an, um, an increased workload uh, based on the errors that you would see in Synergy for uploads in that purpose because of that override specifically happening in NEO. Um, it's not going to match and you could ask why that wouldn't match. Um, you maybe discuss it with your nutrition director. They're only going to be able to give you so much information, um, but um, it will likely not align between the two. And here's another rewind reminder. Um, for EPS purposes, for the calculation for school funding, we actually are collecting data on a specific date, October 1. What is the student's situation? Where are they located? Where are they attending? Uh, who's responsible for subsidy, are they special ed, are they English learners, are they economically disadvantaged as of October 1. That's the date EPS wants to know. We don't, we don't need any other date throughout the year for EPS purposes. So somebody had asked about, uh, is it ongoing or whatever? Um, so for instance, so the direct sir, again, I don't know the answer to that, but what I can tell you is the, the data that we're pulling for EPS calculations is only as of October 1, period. Um, so we had, I'm just reviewing the questions over here on the side. Um, it is correct that, um, so, this form, the alternate economic status form, is only to be used for EPS funding. It's not used for ESA, ESEA, and it's not used for nutrition. It is only for EPS funding purposes. Um, so I see that question quite a bit popping up. Um, we do update D the direct certification list as often as we receive information from DHHS um, to ensure that that data is in um, as soon as possible uh, for your, specifically for October 1st. Uh, we also had a suggestion that if you're not able to hear, maybe turning on closed captioning. Um, I'm not sure if we can see that. 
There's also a question about using this for E-rate. I'm not familiar with what E-rate is. I, do, I would I would say no, it's not part of EPS, so I'm going to say no because I don't know what E-rate is. Uh, but this again, this form is only for EPS purposes. That's it, period, nothing else. Somebody so, asked about also, how they put it in. Sorry, go yeah, ahead, Alan. Yeah, that's okay. Um, so the so if a student if a family does not return this form, um, then they would be updated back to full pay as of the beginning of the school year. So um, beginning of the school year is for date purposes seven one, but it can be based off of your first day back at school. If you don't have an updated form as of seven one to uh, until. October 1st, then you would not be able to report that data um, as economically disadvantaged. You'd have to re revert them to full pay. But again, this form isn't the only way. If they are submitting a free and reduced lunch form or are on direct cert, then they are still considered economically disadvantaged even without this form. And I don't mean to confuse the situation. Yes. <laughs> I'm ju we're just trying to help get as many uh, responses. If as you we can. don't have any of these um, forms, so if you don't have the free and reduced lunch form for the current school year or you don't have alternate economic status form for the current school year, then they can't be reported as economically disadvantaged on e October 1st reporting, essentially is what Paula is saying. Someone else said something about the data would have to match if we're using the data for reports and when we verify October 1 and April 1. I'm assuming you mean the SIS data. Um, and I, again, I don't know how your local data collection works with the state collection. I will say this, the April count um, is not used for EPS anymore. It is used for tuition. Um, and so, yes, you, we still we, we are still collecting that data on in April. But that's not um, for EPS calculation. Right. Um, so we had a clarifying question. If we use C CEP or federal nutrition for, for, for federal nutrition purposes, we should also be using that consistent percentage um, for the three year duration for ESEA reporting. Um, so I'm assuming that the two are tied together um, in uh, ESEA and child nutrition, but I'm not sure, so I'll let Jess or Jane speak to that question. Can you read that question one more time? Sorry, I was looking for answers for another question in the chat. Sure. Um, so if we use CEP for federal nutrition purposes, we should also be using that consistent percentage for the three year duration for ESEA reporting, as in when we do our title fund. Meg, I'm about to pull in the chat a resource I assume you're talking about for rank and distribution purposes in the application where you input the student poverty enrollment data. If you are a CEP school, then you will be using the direct cert information um, and I will put a resource in the chat that outlines how you do that. Um, and just just make sure that you publish your um, answers so that they can see them. Oh, thank you. I've been privately yeah, replying, no so that's helpful. No problem. Um, so there's also a question here about a field being updated in Synergy for state reporting uh, for the alternate form. Um, we do not currently have a field to identify that students have been identified as economically disadvantaged using the alternate economic status form. Um, however, um, we are looking at it for the future. This, this current year, we are asking that districts retain the record of students who were identified as economically disadvantaged using the free uh, using the alternate economic status form and we will be asking later in the school year for a record of those students who were identified using this form so we are asking that they are held on to um, there's a question about electronic forms if you 
would like to use an electronic form, you are more than welcome to use that in your district. Um, if you believe it will get you a higher response rate, there is that option. Um, I've heard really good return from a lot of districts who are using an electronic form. Um, so that is an option for anyone who would like to use that modality. I was just going to speak to that, Allie, too. Thank you. Um, and I'll, I'll just add to that. The, the form that we've created is a template for you to use. The requirements of how they are eligible to be considered economically disadvantaged have to be the same, but how you distribute the form and how you receive back uh, confirmation from your district and from your parents, certainly up to you and a lot of districts have made it electronic so that it's easier to uh, send, collect and and frankly to uh, verify and save because it is ultimately up to the district to ensure that uh, these collections are, are happening. You're not going to be sending anything to the state. Uh, this is this is for your collection and for your reporting to us about uh, what the economically disadvantaged status is for your students. Um, so if you are not participating this year in CEP or special provision two, um, then you are still welcome to use the alternate economic status form. Um, you will, for lunch purposes, need to collect the free and reduced lunch form for families or uh, uh, students who would like or receiving free lunch. Um, you can still collect the free and reduced lunch form. The alternate economic status form can be used in addition if you would like. However, any data that is submitted, if you receive conflicting information on the alternate form versus the, uh, the free and reduced lunch form, you need to use what was entered or, or submitted via the free reduced lunch meal form in order to report. And I'm going to add to that. Ellie's using words like you can or if you would like. I'm going to say you really should. Uh, because if you are not, if you're a CEP or a special provision and you're not collecting those other forms, we have for EPS purposes, we have to have an annual collection. And so if you don't use the alternate form, I suspect your economic disadvantage status is going to be lower than it should. So that's just my little uh, EPS well, this was push. Specific to, this was specific to districts that are not receiving, uh, not participating in CEP or special provision too. It is still an option for districts who are not participating and they and use it, yes. should use it in addition. I hear what you're saying. Yeah. I'm sorry, yes. I, I, I'm sorry, I, I did say that wrong. I apologize. Yes, thank you for clearing that up. Yeah. I recommend, frankly, sending them both. And if you get them both back, great. Uh, the first, the, the free and reduced lunch form always trumps the other form, but this, some, some people are more willing to send the alternate form than they are the uh, free and reduced lunch form for, for whatever reason. So I recommend sending both. So if you're looking to collect data for ESCA, then the form to use would be the free and reduced meal form. So it's the I alternate just want to clarify. Yeah, oh, sorry, it. Allie, I'm just going to clarify <laughs> there. <laughs> yes, for ESCA purposes, I believe um, the questions aren't clear what specifically you're talking about for where you use that data. I assume you're talking about the rank and distribution page within the ESEA consolidated application. On that page, all SAUs have to input the specific school level student counts and they can choose to use direct certification student counts, direct certification with a 1.6 multiplier student counts, Free, free meal student counts or free and reduced meal student counts. I just put that in the chat. I'm also about to share a link that gives a little bit more detail about um, the direct cert data um, from a non-regulatory guidance that the federal government has put out. So hopefully that clarifies those questions. If you have uh, additional questions, feel, feel free to put them in the chat. So there's a question here I just want to clarify as well um, that 
their understanding is that they should not be collecting the free and reduced lunch forms. If your district is part of special provision two or CEP, you cannot collect the free and reduced lunch form and should not collect the free and reduced lunch form. That is why we've implemented this alternate economic status form, which you can use for EPS funding reporting only to be entered into your local student information center uh, system and then update uploaded into Synergy directly and then subsequently NEO. Um, so if you are participating in any of those programs and you cannot use the free and reduced lunch form, then you need to use this alternate form because we are still for EPS purposes, we do collect an we do have an annual requirement of collecting um, economic status for in for student at student level. So you do still need to collect some sort of identifier of economic status. If you're not able to collect the free and reduced lunch form, collect the alternate economic status form. I'm just reviewing some of the questions before we move on. This information does get um, reported for October 1. Um, this should be entered into your system with an effective date prior to October 1 in order to be counted on the October 1st reports. Um, so if you receive data back um, in your effective date, it should be the beginning of the school year. You want to make sure that that data overlaps the October 1 date in order to be counted for EPS purposes. Uh, that's another thing we see is the overlap of October 1st, if you have an effective date for economic status that starts after October 1, it is not going to be a count that is pulled into the report. So we um, we are asking for students who are identified using the alternate economic status form. That is the question that we are going to be asking. Um, so for those of you moderating also, um, in order for people to see the answer to the question, you have to publish the question and the answer to the question. So if they're not seeing it, sorry, I should have been more clear. Um, so you have to make sure that you publish both so that they can see them. Uh, so if you answered a question, just make sure that you've published, clicked publish. Um, so I'm sorry, Allie. Um, yeah. So can you ask for the students that have lunch application instead of who has filled out? The form? So are you saying you need to keep the names? You actually should keep these forms. These are right. forms that you that should maintain. Yeah. yeah, right. You should maintain these forms in some electronic fashion or in some uh, collection for seven years because these are a co data collection form and just like any other collection you are supposed to maintain records for a certain number of years and I believe it's seven um, so yes you need to hold on to these somewhere why are you saying you won't be reporting on October 1 I don't understand why you would say that yeah, this has like I answered that question. Uh, it, it, in order for the economic status to be counted, it ha that uh, that economic status enrollment has to overlap October one. Has to be starting on October first or before October first, with an end date after October first. Yeah, and and the alternate form doesn't have an end date. So if you collect it at the beginning of the year, then that means they are economically disadvantaged on October one. If you collect it this year. That's that's what we say. We're not giving you economic status isn't going to change that quickly in a year, in a given year, unlikely. So if you collect it this year, they are on October 1 using the alternate form. You collect it any time after school starts till October 1. They are economically disadvantaged for the year. Um, somebody's asking about how a three year period is determined for EPS percentage. We don't have a three year period for for the EPS percentage. That's ESEA and nutrition. Or maybe just nutrition. 
That's why we have to have an annual yearly collection of the alternate economics disadvantage status for EPS because we don't do a three year period. Meg, yeah, I'm not sure what you're referencing for the three year period. Jean from Nutrition, do you know what she might be referencing there? Yes, that's special provision. They collect the base year and then the percentage is used for the following three years. So that's just for special provision too. Oh, I see. OK, Meg, I think I can answer your question now. I, I see what you're trying to ask. Um, so for the ESEA rank and distribution page, what you're going to do, I think I'll put a, a link to this in the chat as well for special provision too. Um, but what you need to do for rank and distribution purposes is you have that percentage of poverty from that base year from special provision two. When you update those student enrollment counts for the following year, you're going to take that percentage and just apply it to your new enrollment. So that will give you the updated poverty counts for the rank and distribution table. I will put another guidance in the chat um, that shows an example of that. Feel free to reach out to your ESEA regional program manager and we're also happy to individually walk you through that process um, if that's helpful. But I'll put that resource in the chat so hopefully that'll help you out. And once again, those that information is only determined using the free and reduced lunch form. That's not the alternate economic status form. The alternate ec economic status form is only for purposes of EPS funding. So that's where our focus really is today um, in this um, EPS funding alternate economic status form. Um, so I see we've kind of moved, gotten to the bottom of questions, so I'm going to continue to move forward. Um, in our presentation. Do we sound ready for that, ladies? <laughs> OK. <laughs> All right. So the alternate economic status, as I stated earlier, we do have um, an updated version of it this year. Um, so this is the new form for this current school year. Uh, we've tried to take out as much reference to lunch form as possible because it is um, separate from that lunch form. Uh, so it is used for EPS funding purposes. So this form can be used with all students, whether you're participating in CEP or, um, or special provision two or not. Um, so you can use this with all students. That's why it was the bottom of the pyramid there so that um, you can use it as a blanket for all students to identify for EPS funding purposes. It is used to determine economic disadvantage um, eligibility for EPS funding purposes only. It is not used for nutrition or ESEA. That's separate. This data gets entered from this form directly into your student information system, which communicates up to state synergy. Um, this is only to be entered by individuals who are uploading data into state synergy. This, the restrictions around this, uh, this data collection is that the form cannot be used for lunch services. This does not qualify anyone for uh, free and reduced lunch, and it does not qualify for ESEA. It is not entered by nutrition staff. Once again, only data staff should be entering this information. And it is not, so once again, not used for ESEA programming. So this is your option if you're not able to collect free and reduced lunch forms. This is your alternative form for collecting for EPS form funding. Pretty sure the question that's in there is an answer is a no, but I'm going to let uh, Jane look at that one because it has to do with direct cert and nutrition. I was typing, Paula. I was typing. Oh, Jane, can't you be quicker? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but nutrition direct lists are not allowed to provide direct start lists to anyone in the school at all. 
But again, you don't need to. We are collecting that. We get that information. We are putting that into our system already. If you try to tell us that this particular student is not economically disadvantaged when you upload into Synergy for, for the October 1 counts, our system is going to already know that they are from the direct cert list, and it's not going to allow you to overwrite that. So the way that that looks uh, kind of goes into our next slide here. Um, so the data entry for free and for economic status. Um, when you are entering data, so if you are able to collect free and reduced lunch forms, um, your nutrition system can communicate with your local student information system to enter that data for um, upload into state synergy. Um, you do need to communicate about free and reduced lunch status um, within the district to be able to upload to state synergy for the purpose of, of EPS funding. So there needs to be communication between nutrition directors and data specialists about free and reduced lunch form. Um, so that could be an automatic ETL from one system to the other or communication with uh, between those individuals. Once the data is uploaded from the local student information system into state synergy, um, you can enter this data as reduced status. Um, and so that would be on the economic status upload or via manual entry into the student module under economic status. So we have you can do an automatic upload or you can do a manual entry of this data into state synergy. Once again, we are asking that a record of students identified using the alternate form be kept at the SAU level. So retain the students who were identified as reduced status via the alternate economic status form on an additional form so that we can, when we ask for that data later on in the year, you have that information ready to go. Um, and then, uh, everything gets uploaded into the NEO EPS October 1 student count report, and that will be kind of an aggregate count of those free reduced lunch um, and or alternate economic status. Um, and then also direct certification will override any of those students who are an indicated full price. Um, they will be indicated as economic disadvantage in um, NEO in this October 1 report. Uh, a few quick notes. Um, so you, there needs to be a record of those alternate economic status forms. We'll be asking for the SSID numbers of students identified as economically disadvantaged with that form. Um, alternate economic status forms cannot be used for child nutrition or ESEA programming, um, including your rank and distribution table. These forms are an option for SAUs that are not collecting free and reduced lunch forms. As Paula said, you should collect them. You can give them to everyone and have that come back. Um, so you can send that out to everyone. It is kind of a blanket form, the alternate economic status form for any student to be identified as economically disadvantaged. I'm going to put a plug for communication in your district. Uh, somebody said, but you ask us to certify the total count, including direct cert. So I realize this is this is all very new because we're we're having to split out, separate these three high level funding sources that used to all be done with one sort, one collection. It's going to take a lot to get used to. We get that, but we have we can't help it there is so many changes at the federal level have happened to make this necessary and so we we truly are sorry we're trying to make it better i promise you in the meantime we also want to make sure that the funding provided through the state eps formula is the most that you're supposed to get i want to make sure every district gets everything they should according to the formula calculation so that being said somebody's asking uh, but we asked to certify the total account I'm going to say yes, there are two people in your district that can access direct cert lists. You don't need to have a copy of that list, but I guess you can talk to them, communicate. The nutrition director and the superintendent have access to those lists. 
So in order to for the superintendent to certify the October 1 enrollment for us every year, that's that's their position, that's their job. They really need to work together with the collection of both of these options or so that the total economically disadvantaged status will include everyone that is eligible. That's my plea for communication in the district. And the superintendent is the person that we are asking to certify this data. It is not supposed to be data specialists who are certifying these sets. It or is business supposed manager. To be super, right. It is supposed to be our um, superintendents who are certifying this data and they do have access. So it may be something to communicate with superintendents that they need to cross reference those lists that they should have access to um, with what has been entered into that by the data specialist. They may may be your point person on this. All right, for any further questions, we will kind of leave it open for questions for a few more minutes, um, but we do have some contact information. If you have questions about how to enter this data, uh, please feel free to contact me. Um, I'm Alexandra Cooks. I don't know if I even introduced myself, um, but I'm the data quality trainer and I would be happy to help you with entering this data. Um, and uh, for reporting questions, please feel free to reach out to the Madeline's Help Desk. Um, I think Paula has been fielding quite a few questions about the alternate economic status form. Um, I don't know how she feels about me throwing her out there, but I think she would She's she's very well versed in her spiel, I think, at this point of how this works. Call me 624-6792. Happy to help. Yes. Again, I truly want everybody to get the amount of funding they should have, and this is yes. the only way that we know of to do it right now. So there was a question about counts being off for um, this. Um, how can the superintendent reconcile the data? The superintendent can communicate with the um, this attending student details report and what's in synergy, and like they are welcome to go through and do that validation um, of the data before certifying uh, what they're submitting to the state. I'm going to take the next one, Allie, yeah. about has anyone found a way to encourage families to return the forms? Our issue is regardless of which form we use, the families we need to fill them out are choosing mm -hmm. not to. I understand there's, there's probably a stigma attached to uh, economic disadvantage status, which is frankly why the new form um, has been set up in such a way to try to um, not say that in such a way it's it's set up to be what level of of um, income is your family at for their size and as a result of that level of income um, you would qualify for um, do we still call it economic dis no we just say income eligibility guidelines and so student meets lower income household criteria we changed the wording to maybe that's still something people don't want to admit to but um, again i would just maybe a, maybe a letter from the superintendent saying look this information is vital to the state calculation of funding for our entire district and it has nothing to do with individual services to students it's funding for the entire district and so maybe that will help because it's that's why we don't really, you know, technically we, we don't need it at the student level for this purpose. However, we don't know of another way of collecting it yet. We're working on that, but this is extremely important and maybe maybe a letter, maybe a call. I don't know. The next question, uh, the economic indicator uploaded into Synergy, is it used only for um, EPS? Um, it is used for EPS purposes as well as PEBT funding. Um, and so that is one of the reasons that we do ask that it is updated as often as possible. Um, so if you do receive information of a change in status, we are asking that it be updated. Um, for EPS funding purposes, it is only looking at October 1, um, but for 
other purposes, it is used throughout the year um, for PEBT. So it should be updated as often as possible um, for those any changes in status. The eligibility criteria. Um, so eligibility for economic disadvantage or I assuming that I'm assuming that's what they mean. So I just okay. posted the link to the new form, which has the criteria on it. Um, for this year, it changes every year based on federal guidelines at this time. Again, looking for a different way. Um, somebody else that said, uh, said something. Oh, um, uh, something about we only have three weeks. Yes. But we've been we've been we've had this form available for years and we've been uh, teaching about it for a long time and we've been trying to get people to start using it um, for a long time. And so I'm sorry if this is the first year hearing of it, but yes, we need this information for, for the next funding calculation for your district by uh, the October one enrollment collection, which occurs very soon. And the certification of that report does not open until the 16th of October so you have a few additional weeks to get the information back and just backdate the information um, in the enrollment and synergy so that it reflects that October 1 date. And I'll say one more time uh, somebody well maybe is that being published later? Oh I'm looking at the wrong list never mind excuse me. Have superintendents been informed? Are there templates for them for guidance as well? You know what? Um, I've been speaking to superintendents about this for years again also, but I'm going to send a copy of this webinar and the um, uh, presentation, and I'm going to do a, a, a send to all the superintendents so that they are on board as well, as well as business managers and anybody else that I can get to listen to me. So I'm going to send that out this week. Um, so hopefully this is not new to them. Um, then the next question is, um, are school administrators allowed to make a determination as to whether a student is economically disadvantaged? The answer to that is no. Um, so this information needs to be collected from families um, via the alternate economic status form or that free and reduced lunch form, but you need to have some sort of indication from the family of the family's income in order to report on that student's economic status. If you want to call them and ask them over the phone and write that you spoke to them on the phone, and, and that you're reassuring that this is what their level of income is. I'm happy. I'm fine with that. Again, you are collecting the data. You're responsible for ensuring it's accurate. You can't just make an assumption, though. Um, there is no way for um, a local SIS or Synergy to override anything on the direct certification list. Um, that override only happens in NEO based on the on overriding the information entered in syner into Synergy. Um, direct certification in NEO has the ultimate override uh, power. Um, and so if you are uploading information into Synergy or NEO uh, up into Synergy, um, that does not uh, it, it will not interfere. You will not get an error message back from Synergy saying that is incorrect because you're entering based on your best knowledge of that student's economic status. Your best knowledge is may be full price. Um, as long as you're uploading consistently into Synergy as full price, you should not get an error kickback. However, that student may be marked on all of your NEO reports as economically disadvantaged. So you won't get any kickback um, for errors in Synergy if a student is on direct certification. That goes back to your local SIS does not necessarily have to match the direct certification list. You don't need to have that data in order to have it all aligned. You just need to know that there may be some variation between the Synergy system and the NEO system uh, based and it may be due to that direct certification. Uh, somebody reached out to me that they downloaded the form, but it it still had the free and reduced and it was an older form. We do have an, a newer version available 
that was updated on August 3rd. Please make sure you have the most recent version yeah, uh, that you were down. Yeah, there's an FY23 and an FY24. I'm going to delete the FY23. We don't need that anymore. Okay. We'll get that done today. Uh, but there was an earlier version of the FY24 one that wasn't as streamlined as this one. And so the newer version as of, as of August 3rd is the one that uh, you should be looking for, please. Paula, is there a, there's no verification process, is there, or do you want to speak to a verification process of this? Yeah, there is no verification. This is not as uh, tight uh, as federal requires. Um, however, what there is, is a collection. And so we are asking you to ask parents and we are trusting that they are being honest. We are trusting that you are collecting from them and that you are providing the the responses that they have provided. That's the verification. So if all of you all of a sudden become 100% economically disadvantaged, I might question that. <laughs> All right, I'm starting to see some numbers drop and I'm starting to see fewer questions coming in. Um, once again, I did want to put a plug in that if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. Uh, we are all working very um, vigilantly to be on the same page and this alternate economic status form um, and how it is not used for ESEA or nutrition funding, um, how the forms can communicate uh, if you're using free and reduced lunch forms. Um, so we are working very hard to ensure that there's consistency in our messaging. Um, and so please feel free to reach out to any one of us um, in with any questions about um, how the forms are used. And once again, this for, this will be posted on the it will be on the DOE data playlist in the main DOE uh, YouTube channel. So this will be publicly available. Um, I should have it out by this afternoon. I'm hoping, uh, as long as nothing goes horrifically wrong. <laughs> Thank you, and seriously, everybody, if you would like to reach out to me directly, uh, my phone number is six two four. 6792. This is Paula, the director of uh, school finance, and happy to to talk about this with you. Uh, Ali and the help desk are better uh, for answering questions about how to enter the data into our systems. I can answer questions about how you're collecting it. All right, with that being said, I hope everyone has a great rest of their day and we will look forward to seeing you next Tuesday for the quarterly reporting webinar at 10 a.m. Have a great day, everyone.